Yes, my name is Sean Thompson, and today I'm going to be talking to you about hope. We've heard some amazing, inspiring stories today and yesterday. Wonderful stories that certainly inspired me, and I'm sure they, uh, they inspired uh, all of you. We've heard a lot of stories about loss. We've heard a lot of stories about uh, tragic encounters. We've heard stories about disempowerment, disengagement, disassociation. And I want to tell you my story. It's a simple story about hope. And to all of you that work with young people who have been traumatized, I want to give you a little tool. It's a tool that you could uh, put in your toolkit and you can use an EGP to help empower young people and to help young people empower themselves and also to empower their friends. So the talk's called The Light, uh, the light Sounds Ahead and I hope you enjoy uh, what I have to say. So I'm going to give you two things today. Let's see if we can get this to work. One is the perspective of a life that's being lived with passion and purpose and another is a simple tool called The Code. And the code is a collection of words that young people write about themselves, identifying their purpose and what they're going to do with their future. Simple tool that's built around two profound words. And those two profound words are I will. Not what's being, not what's happened to me, but what I'm going to do about it. What I will do. So a brief uh, summary of my background, I grew up in uh, South Africa in a segregated society. I grew up under the apartheid regime where blacks and whites were split by a system. I grew up on the beach in a place called Durban in South Africa. That's my mom and my sisters. My mom and my father were both survivors of trauma. My mother grew up on the island of Malta, and during the Second World War, during the four years that she lived there, was the most heavily bombed place in the history of the world. She endured 3,400 air raids, two direct hits. In fact, she lived underground for about uh, nearly three years. Uh, but my mom was this tower of optimism and hope. She's 88 years old. She's still alive today. Every single conversation with my mom ends with the same two words. God bless. I'll tell you a little bit about my father a little bit later. I lived across the road from the beach, fell in love with the ocean. The ocean became an obsession and a passion for me. I learned to swim on this beach and ultimately learned how to surf. And surfing, from the first moment I stood up on a board, gripped me. That feeling of exhilaration, that feeling of absolute control and mastery of this amazing environment, uh, the ocean. I got good pretty quickly. In fact, at 11 years old, I came third in my first surfing competition. There were only three of us, but I'm playing in that third place. And from then on, I knew that uh, I loved competition. I loved the feeling. Even though I came last or third, depending on, on the perspective, I've always had the perspective of third. I started to, to do well quite quickly. My father was a big uh, supporter of mine. He was the proudest dad in the world when I made the South African surfing team for the first time to compete in Australia at 14 years old. I won my first surfing contest when I was 17. It was one of the, the biggest competitions in the world. And ultimately, I went on to win 19 major professional events all over the world, became, a, um, became one of the people that helped create professional surfing that today is worth about $3 billion and created the professional surfing industry. I started my first surfing company when I was 22 years old, grew into a large company. We had 800 employees sold in, in 13, um, 13 countries. I called my first company Instinct. And I called it Instinct because as a sportsman, the very best moments happen when one is operating on Instinct. A couple of months ago, I had the pleasure of meeting this wonderful professor, a guy called Miha Csikszentmihalyi. He's an amazing guy out of a Cameron Graduate University who developed the concept of flow, the concept of optimal performance, that state of exalted happiness, a state of transcendence. And that was the feeling that one gets when one is surfing and when one is operating on instinct and when you're riding inside the tube. That's what surfers call it. It's the ultimate moment in surfing when you ride inside this cylinder of water 
completely hidden from view. It's you, the ocean, and the board. It's an absolute fusion of mind, body, and soul. And when you're standing there on your board, inside this watery hurricane, it feels like time is expanded. It feels like you're actually in this tunnel of molten glass. You're standing there on your board going at maximum speed, which is about 30 miles an hour. The past is right here. The present's beneath your feet, and you're riding on this little sliver of fiberglass, and the future is just spinning ahead of you, and you're looking for that light that shines ahead. And sometimes when you're operating and surfing at the outer envelope of your ability, you actually feel that you can control that way. I felt that I could control the curvature of that wall. This is what it feels like when one is surfing inside the tube. Thinking to a deep barrel, it certainly feels like time's expanded. Life has slowed down. I felt that I could curve that all to my will. I really felt that. It's a magical, magical moment. It's an incredible moment. My God, he changed the way we wrote tunes off the wall. Like all of us at the time, we were thinking about what we could do to leave our mark. And Sean, you know, had a huge influence of, of the involvement of modern day tube writing. He's doing things on singletons in the 70s that, uh, you know, a lot of guys aren't doing that. Trust us now, um, you know, the barrel shots, there's some slow motion shots of him riding the home ball. Um, just unbelievable modern, way ahead of his time barrel riding. So for 16 years, that was my life. Riding the biggest, best waves in the world, always half naked, with just a little <laughs> pair of shorts on, meeting wonderful people, traveling to these exotic destinations, and that was my life for 16 years. A relatively idyllic existence where as a young man, I was indulging myself in my passion and my obsession, and along the way, creating companies and building professional surfing into the sport it is today. I retired from pro surfing in uh, 1989, um, and uh, my wife and I fell in love. We, we, we had babies shortly thereafter, and I decided to move to the United States. Uh, we moved to San Barbara, we moved to Montecito, and that's where we live currently. And shortly after uh, I was going to leave for the United States, a friend of mine phoned me up and said, Sean, I want to create the world's first surfing environmental organization. Like all of you here today, your work is associated with children, motivating, inspiring children that have faced trauma. This guy could see the environment was facing trauma. He said, Sean, Malibu is under severe environmental strain. That's the iconic surfing break where surfing was developed in California. He said, I want to do something about it. I'm going to create this organization, and I want you to be our first ambassador. I said, great. He said, I want to use you in an advertisement. I said, cool. Here's a picture, and I'll even write the copy for you. Do a good turn today. The turn in surfing is the fundamental maneuver, so do a good turn as the double entendre. And the organization over the years has become very successful. We now have 55,000 members. We have about 60 chapters around the country. And I became the first ambassador in, uh, in, in the late 80s. Shortly after we arrived in, um, in the United States, We'd started a clothing company, my wife and I, we started a company called Solitude, we made super cool shirts, this is one of our, our old shirts. Uh, the same guy phoned me up, a guy called Ben Henning, and he said, Sean, your adopted break in Santa Barbara, called Rincon, is also under severe environmental pressure. So Rincon's one of the most famous waves in the world, when the surf is good, you can catch a wave from all the way at the top of the point, you can ride about a mile in to the beautiful beach um, below. He said, all the homeowners of those multi-million dollar homes are connected up to septic tank systems. When it rains, like it has been over the last week, the septics fill up. The poo overflows, it flows out in the river, it bisects the line, it flows out into the ocean, servers get sick. He said, I want to do something about it. I want to ultimately get all these homeowners connected up to the septic system, and I'm going to do it through children. I'm going to bring a group of 100 children down to the beach, and by bringing the children down, I'm going to make them more environmentally aware. We're going to bring the media down, and we're going to use the kids to draw awareness and attention to this particular problem. He said, I want you to give something to the children. 
give something to the children so they're going to become more environmentally aware. He said, I've got a hundred dollar budget. There's a hundred kids, you've got a hundred dollar budget. The guy was a big time thinker. So at the time I thought, well, what can I do for a hundred dollars to inspire a group of a hundred young students? So at the time, my wife and I had our company solitary, I think, well, I'll give them groovy shirts, you know, 100 kids, groovy shirts, maybe they'll be connected to the environment with, with our cool shirts. I knew the CEOs of all the fabulous surfing companies that have grown out of surfing, Quicksilver, Billabong, Hurley, Balkan, some of the younger guys and girls here might know the, those brands. I thought of the CEOs, I'll get them to give us pride. And then I thought, no, I don't want them to become young capitalists, I want them to become young, Environmentalists, I'm going to give them the gift that surfing has given me. I'm going to give them the gift of philosophy and spirituality and camaraderie and brotherhood that surfing's given me. So I sat down on my desk, pulled out a sheet of paper, and in 30 minutes wrote 12 lines. Every line begins with, I will. Stream of consciousness, in 30 minutes I wrote the 12 fundamental lessons that surfing has taught me. And I couched it in the context of what I'm going to do in the future because I was hoping the young boys and girls were going to read it and go, I will always paddle back up. What does that mean? I will always paddle back up. I will never turn my back on the ocean. I will catch a wave every day, even in my mind. Because what I wrote in stream of consciousness manner was camaraderie, brotherhood, courage, bravery, resilience, persistence, dedication, discipline, exhilaration, obsession, passion. You can peel this any way that you want and layer in whatever meaning you want. And then, with a hundred bucks, I printed up a hundred cards. Little plastic cards. I actually still have a card in my uh, pocket. I carry it in, uh, in my wallet with me. My little surface code card. And I called it Surface Code. I printed out 100 cards, cost me 100 bucks. I was a businessman, I made sure I came in on budget. And I gave out 100 cards to the young children that came down to the beach the following week. And I'll tell you straight that this little card changed my life. And this little card has changed the life of millions of young people around the world. And I'll tell you the story of how words and stories can create a positive way. Right throughout the community and around throughout the world. So the cards became popular. Hang out the hundred cards, the kids thought, well, these are pretty cool. More kids wanted the cards, moms and dads wanted the cards, teachers wanted the cards, businessmen wanted the cards. And we started putting the cards in our clothing. And we made a lot of clothes at that time. So hundreds of thousands of these cards ultimately got out into the community. And it was like dropping a little stone. And it creates a little ripple. And that ripple ultimately turns into a wave. And a lot of people were inspired by these words. And I like to think that these words didn't come from me. They came from the surf. They came from the ocean. They came to me from God. So ultimately led to a book. Uh, over a summer, I was talking at a community event. A guy came up to me after I spoke. He said, sure, wow, make a terrific book. 12 lines, 12 stories. I said, I've never written a book before. He said, well, I haven't written a book either, but I'm a professor of French literature, okay, in the Midwest, <laughs> but I'm going to have some time this summer. So over a summer, we collaborated and together. I wrote my first book, and it was called Surface Code, and every single chapter was an exploration of those 12 lines that I had written a, a couple of years before. And I thought, I'm going to show you what I share with young people. So I speak to about 50,000 students every year all over the world, and I talk to them about hope, I talk to them about commitment, I talk to them about internal power based on those two simple words, I will. I'm not a victim, I will. I'm not looking backwards, I'm looking forwards. I will. So the first story is about attitude and it concerns my dad. I told you my mom was a survivor of 3,400 air raids. My dad was a survivor too, but in a different way. My dad was one of South Africa's top swimmers, and this is connected with a chapter in the book called I'll Never Turn My Back on the Ocean. And the Hawaiians believe implicitly and explicitly in this concept. Never turn your back on the ocean, because we're in Hawaii, and a 30-foot wave breaks out there and rushes up the beach. 
If you've got your back to the ocean, that wave is going to snatch you. Wow. And the undertow and the riptide is going to take you out. So they never turn the back on the ocean. And also from a perspective of, man, if you've got passion, you love something, you never turn your back on it. So my dad really represented to me this ethos. In his young days, he was South Africa's best swimmer. At 13, he won the South African Swimming Championships. And all he wanted to do was compete for his country in the Olympic Games. Unfortunately, the Second World War got in the way. He volunteered and fought in the South African Air Force against the Italians and the Germans. And when he came back in 1945, after he was demobilized, he resumed his swimming career. The 1948 Olympic Games were coming up. In 1947, he was training, and he was on the beach with his little wooden surfboard out of the lineup at a beach right near where I grew up. And this is what happened to him. These are my dad's own words. I was lifted clear from the water. A Zambezi shark came up underneath him at such speed, with such force and ferocity, that he told me it threw him into the air. And one bite nearly severed his arm from his shoulder. One bite. My dad's swimming career was done. It dropped him back into the water. And he told me that shark circled him. And this is how my dad dealt with trauma. I would say to him for years afterwards, all his friends scattered. He was left out there alone in the bloody water with this Zambezi shark circling him. One great lifeguard paddled out and pulled him in. I said, Dad, Dad, what happened to the shark? Like, I'm asking him, like, did the shark swim away? He said, don't worry about the shark, you died of blood poisoning. <laughs> That's how he dealt with that trauma with the human. My dad's swimming career was done. His life passion was over. But all I remember of my father, other than the terrible scars that he had on his arm, was this, this amazing smile and him teaching me how to swim a hundred yards away from where he'd been attacked by the shark when I was uh, four or five years old. And I wrote this little piece on attitude a number of years ago, and I'd like to read it to you because it really typifies my dad's attitude. Not his perspective, not how he saw life, but how he felt and lived life. Every one of us lives in a challenging sea, and our attitude towards those challenges defines who we are and how we live our lives. Our attitude about the present defines our future. Our attitude about the future defines the present. Our attitude defines how we see the world and how the world sees us. Our attitude is the power that propels us on a journey from where we are to where we want to be. And it's a fundamental choice for all of us. What is your attitude? Positive or negative? Optimistic or pessimistic? Hope or despair? Light or darkness? It's a simple choice. It's a choice to be made by everyone in this room, and this choice can change us and change our lives and change the world all around us. We have heard people talk about the most severe trauma. And in one moment, one moment, they change their path. They changed their life. Yes, maybe they met someone who was a mentor. Maybe they met a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker who helped them. And you all have that power to help fundamentally change and mold that attitude so people can have that epiphany and have that change. I'm sure all of you have read this book, one of the greatest books ever written. I've written this book so many times and there's been so so much talk about, about the Holocaust. Man does have a choice of action. And everything can be taken from a man by one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way, that choice. We've heard so much talk and research on resilience. I want to give you my perspective on resilience. So at 19 years old, I was in Hawaii. Hawaii for surfers was the ultimate place to go. There's seven miles on the island of Oahu between a little town called Haleiwa and Sunset Beach, and surfers call it the Seven Mile Miracle because it has the greatest, most challenging waves in the world. And as a young boy growing up in South Africa, all I wanted to do was go on that voyage, on that Odyssean voyage to go to Hawaii to surf the biggest, most challenging waves in the world. I wanted to go there and show the world what, what I could do. So while there are many breaks along that little stretch of seven mile coastline, the biggest wave of all is a place called Waimea Bay. This is a place of primal fear. The waves are so big that they actually break in slow motion. 
and that you'll have a 30 foot wave breaking 300 yards out and it hits the surface of the water with such concussive power that you can stand on the beach and through the coral, boom, you can feel that impact. And I stood on the beach at 19 years old, I made the final of this event by qualifying with the surf was small at another break and suddenly the surf had come up and I'm faced with 25 to 30 foot wide man, 19 years old, the youngest guy in the event, I'm the only foreigner and I'm up against five Hawaiian legends and I'm standing on the beach feeling that concussive power of the wave, and my heart is just beating and I am experiencing fear like I've never experienced before. I actually start to shake. I haven't even got a board big enough. I run around the beach trying to borrow a board. A friend lends me a board. And I paddle out into the lineup with these five uh, Hawaiian regions, people that I had revered. It was like paddling out, like being at the NBA basketball final and Michael Jordan's there and Cody's there and all the greats, Kareem is there. And I'm there with my heroes paddling out into surf, unimaginably big. So I think I'm going to get the first wave of this final. Determined to make my mark. And right there, this big wave comes towards me. It's the biggest wave I've ever seen, about 25 feet. And I start paddling for this wave. And what happens, the wave is so big, you look over the edge, it's like looking over a five-story building. That's what it feels like. And you take off and you drop in. And right at the moment when the wave is at its highest, that's when a surfer catches it. And right there, that's when I catch that wave. And I'm thinking in my mind, and I can still clearly remember this. I've got this. I've got this. And all of you know, when you've got this, it's the precursor to something bad. So I drop through space. Fortunately, the video doesn't work. But this is what happens to me. My board free falls. The wave goes absolutely vertical. And I start fluttering through space. The board lands. My legs buckle <clears throat> from the impact of a 30 foot wave. And I skip across the surface of the water like one skips a stone. Boom, boom, boom. And it happens in slow motion. And while it's happening to me, I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be really bad. And I'm perfectly in control of my emotions, perfectly conscious of what's happening, just thinking, man, this is going to be bad. And friends of mine have told me, when the wave impacts you in one way there, it's like being run over by a Mack truck. And I'm flying across the surface of the water, boom, 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 and the whole Pacific Ocean converges and hits me right here. And I'm on the surface of the water, I couldn't impact. And it hits me there and smashes me to the coral below at 30 feet. It actually felt like it had cracked me in half. And it takes me down so fast that I think my eyes are going to pop out of my sockets and my eardrums are going to burst. And sometimes that's what happens in Wyoming Bay. People's eardrums just burst from the force of that pressure. And it pins me on the coral. And there's a vortex down there, the sounds of terrible rocks being thrown around. And I'm just trying to put myself in a ball to protect my head from getting smashed into the reef. And while I'm down there, I know I've got 17 seconds to live. 17 seconds. I'm totally conscious. I know that if I don't get back up to the surface in 17 seconds, the next wave is going to come over me and I'm going to die. Because I've never, ever spoken in my life to anyone that's been under two waves. So I'm up there trying to get my foot in, trying not to panic. Because the more you panic, you start losing gas. Now, I've lost a lot of my gas because the wave has hit me so hard it's exploded all the air out of me. But I'm trying to conserve every bit of energy so my life doesn't slip away and I don't die. Eventually, I get my foot in and I start swimming up. And I know, man, I've got to get that breath. I've got to get that breath before the next wave comes. And I know there's about five or six more waves because when you ride big waves, what you're never supposed to do is pick the first wave of the set. So I've like made cardinal mistake number one. But in my excitement to be in this final and to make my mark on the final I took the first wave. So I get through to that surface and I take one goal. And that's the goal that saves my life. Because when you get held under a big wave and you start drowning, there's this feeling of absolute frenzy paddling for the surface. It's unlike any other moment of danger that one experiences in, one, in one's life. That feeling of suffocation, that feeling of abject helplessness, but the panic just comes over you, which magnifies the danger. So I got that breath right then when I was at the point of panic, and it saved me. 
The next wave detonated right on my head and I had to go through that whole cycle again. But I got the, light, I got the breath that saved my life. And it washed me in about 300 yards in to where my board was floating in the lineup. And I dragged myself up my board. There was no jet ski, there was no lifesaver. It was just me and the board. And I got up my board and I lay there. And I tell you what, I was trembling like a little jellyfish. I was so scared. I'd never ever had a wipe out of that import before. And I lay there and I had to decide what you're going to do. And I promise you, every single one of the people, every single one of those kids that you deal with is going to be at the crossroads. And I promise you, every single one of you, every single one of you, no matter where you are in the economic scale, no matter where you are on the career scale, can be faced with that decision. That primal decision. What are you going to do? When your ass is being kicked and you are down, Yes, down. I was down into poverty because I thought I'd bust my back. I thought I was finished. I thought I had no more guts. I thought I had no more courage. I panicked. What am I going to do now? Am I going to paddle in or am I going to paddle back out? And in those moments, one realizes that life is simple, man. Paddle in, paddle back out. Paddle in or paddle back out. And I'm lying on my board trying to decide, what do I do? I'm terrified. I'm shivering. I'm shaking, like I said, like a jellyfish. The ocean. Was 350 yards out to the back line where the surfers, the legends were, 50 yards to the beach. And I had to make that decision, and I had to make it quick because I was in a bar, and time is valuable. I knew what I had to do. That was my destiny. And I remember I swam my board around, and I started paddling back out. And I found, as I paddled back out, with each stroke, the strength started to come through my arms and into my heart, and into my soul. And I realized, resilience is not about introspection. It's not about thinking about what you're going to do. It's about getting up and taking action. One stroke. For me, one stroke. One stroke. One stroke. And I paddled back out, and a 20-footer came to me, and I swung around, and I got it. I paddled back out again, and each time I got stronger, I got more courageous. How do you become courageous? By doing something. How do you become brave? By doing something. How do you become resilient? By doing something. By taking action. And I paddled back out. I got another one. And I got another one. I got three amazing 20-foot bombs, the biggest, best waves I've ever had in my life. And the six of us in the final. And the siren went. And I'm going, yeah. And we all paddled in. And there's 20,000 people on the beach. We're up on the podium. And they start announcing the results. And in sixth place, Sean Johnson. And I go, yes. And I go up there. And I'm like, rocking. I won 19 major pro events. I was the number one guy in the world. I was the one at the youngest age, I won at the oldest age, but I won all my victories. Sixth place at 19 years old was my greatest victory. Because I proved to myself that no matter what, no matter what, no matter what happened to me, I could paddle back out. Why? Because that's where the next wave is. And you know, it sounds like a cliche. It sounds like, yeah, this is. It's not bullshit. I'm not bullshitting you people. This is true. And at the core of my being, I know that only by paddling back out will one find the next wave. So the last story I want to tell you from a service code is the story of Connectivity, which is, I think, one of the most important stories uh, I can tell you. You know, when one suffers loss, trauma, tragedy, one realizes that the fundamental mission of our lives, of my life, is to love and to be loved, to connect with people. So I live in this wonderful area in Santa Barbara in a beautiful little community called Montecito. You might have heard Montecito has been in the news lately with a terrible mudslide where it lost 23 people uh, at the beginning of January. But it's a magnificent community, small community. We have about uh, 4,000 homes, about uh, 10,000 people. And there's a wonderful legend associated with our area, and it's a legend called the Rainbow Bridge. And the legend is, is that the Shumash, Native American tribe that lived in the area hundreds of years ago and still lives there today, grew up on Santa Cruz Island, 
which is 26.1 miles directly south of where I live. And the people were formed from a magic seed by Hutash, the Earth Mother, and her husband, the Milky Way. The sky snake sent down a bolt of lightning, and the people started to multiply and multiply. And in one of the first stories of sustainability, they ran out of resources, so they prayed to her, we need more food. She said, I'm going to create a rainbow bridge for you. And the bridge, you can walk across to the mainland for a new life. And just like the biblical story of Noah, where the rainbow represents hope, the bridge represented hope as well. So the people crossed, and as they crossed, and I tell the story to young people, she said to them, don't look down. And I say to the young crew, what happens when someone tells you not to do something? What do you do? They say, yeah, here we go. So they looked down, and they fell, and they fell, and they started drowning in the channel. She didn't want people to drown, so she turned them all into dolphins. So the legend is that all the dolphins that are in this channel are the descendants of the Shumash people, and I actually surf with these dolphins all the time. And an amazingly strange coincidence, I'm a Jew, some of the speakers today have been Jewish, is the Shumash, or Chumash, um, in Hebrew 5, it means the books, it means the Torah in the written form, the five books of Moses. So there's this connectivity spiritual connectivity between cultures that is quite profound. And right near where the rainbows come down is my favorite beach. Right near my home is called Heaven's Reef, and it's a place where I used to love to surf with, with my son, Matthew. We love to go out there and surf together, and he'd sit next to me in the lineup, and he throws his arm around my shoulder. Man, it's a dad, that was the greatest feeling. His mates are out there, and you know, they're kind of mocking him a bit, but he doesn't care. He's out there just chilling with his dad, waiting for a way together. So on this particular day, my boy and I went down to Hammond's Reef to, to check out the surf. And there was no surf on this particular day. No one around. Just my boy Matthew, gift from God, that's what his name means in Hebrew. He said, Dad, let's go up to the memorial. So right on the beach, there's a memorial to the Shemesh people. They call it Shalawa Meadow. There's a memorial there. You can see it has dolphin figurines that represent the Shemesh people. And a beautiful inscription. The sacredness of the land lies in the mind of its people. This land is dedicated to the spirit and memory of our ancestors and their children. The connectivity between children, between the present, the past, and the future, and the land. So you run up to the memorial, and the tradition is you leave an offering. So he left a piece of shell, and I left a feather, and then he scampered off down the beach. He was about nine or ten at the time. And he said, Dad, help me do this. And he started to pick up these cobblestones that were on the beach. And he arranged them in a circle. Imagine doing this with a 10-year-old boy. Arranged a circle of cobblestones in the sand. And inside that circle, he arranged another circle. And inside that circle, he arranged another circle. I went along with my son, not knowing what he was doing. But it was so cool to see him create something out of nothing. And at the end of my circle, he put down two large stones, and he ran off and he got a stick. He put some feathers and kelp on the stick and came back to me and said, Dad, and he presented what he created. This is a sacred story circle. A sacred story circle. Google sacred, sacred story circle, you will not find one entry. Because it was invented by my beautiful son, Matthew. And he said, what we're going to do, we're going to sit inside the sacred story circle, and we're going to tell each other stories. And he said, here's the rule, the stick. Whoever's got the sacred story stick does what? Tells the story. And what does the other person do? This perfect communication. About two months ago, I read about the Senate using a stick, the sacred story stick, to try to create this, this, this conversation. Because they're so out of control, because it represents perfect communication. Whoever's got the stick tells the story, where the hand of the stick listens. So we sat in front, we sat inside the sacred story circle for an hour, my beautiful son and I, and we told each other sacred stories. And that's the language that we spoke. We spoke in spirit language. I'm not, a, I'm not a therapist. I work with a lot of kids from a little bit of a distance. But when I speak to kids, I like to think I speak in spirit language. And when you all 
speak to your children that have suffered great trauma, I like to think that you speak in spirit language too. Because spirit language is special. It's that unspoken language of love. Like I said, to me, my mission, to love and be loved. So my beautiful son and I, Matthew, we had this amazing moment for an hour inside the Sacred Story Circle, and life was perfect. And out of all the great times I spent on the beaches winning lots of contests and setting the greatest waves and doing all sorts of stuff and writing books and doing some cool things, that was the best moment I've ever spent on a beach in the world anywhere because that love and that connectivity was so profoundly moving, moving. And my son and I, we were in a state of transcendence. Like me, uh, Chiksenia talks about flow. We were in that state of flow. But it came to an end like all amazing things do. And we drove up the hill to my home, which is about half a mile away. And I put my key in the front door. And as I put my key in the front door, my beautiful boy dug in his pocket. And I said, Matthew, what's that? He said, Dad, this is one of the sacred story stones from the sacred story circle. And he put it down right outside my front door. And he said, you know all the stories we told today? Inside that stone. Inside that stone. You put the stone in. If any of you come and visit me in Montecito, I've got a big yellow door, you'll see the sacred story stone there. With all the sacred stories still in it. With all the spirit language that we spoke inside that stone. And you know, ancient Hawaiians believe that mana, life force, psychic energy, the spirit, can be contained in inanimate objects. Like stones, like sharks, and I like to think that a part of our spirit is in it. And every day when I walk home and I see that stone, I remember that most amazing time. So when my wife and I moved to um, the United States with our boy, we started a company called Solitude. This is one of the shirts that we made. It became quite successful and we went through some trials and tribulations. Ultimately, we sold it to a multi-billion dollar uh, a publicly traded apparel company and they put in a thousand doors and blew it up really big. And we were under contract for three years, my wife and I, making more money than we'd ever made before. We were like living that American dream. But our beautiful son was having a couple of challenges at school. He was at uh, Santa Barbara High School. He was 15 and a half. That's us on the beach at uh, Mid Rock and Hammonds. And my wife said, why don't we let him have a semester at your old school in South Africa? Very sort of rigorous school, boys only, boys wore collar and ties to school. It was quite a, a formal school, and she was going to go down there for a semester, and then I was going to join a, a couple of months later. So he was doing great at his new school. Collar and him got on a plane, doing awesome at his uh, new school. And I phoned one day to talk to Collar, and my boy picks up the phone. Hey, Dada. Hey, Matthew. He said, Dada. I want to read you something. And he reads me this. Deep inside the barrel, completely in tune with my inner self, nothing else matters. The hard wind is pitching past me from behind. My hand dragging along the wall, the light shines ahead. My long hair carried by the wind, my feet are completely pressed on the wall. As I lead myself, as I lead forward, I see myself speeding up there faster and faster as the barrel starts to blur. And then I stand up from my legs bed and then I put up the whole line of cheering. My body tingles with joy and happiness. That's just the day when I became a man. Wouldn't it? I went, wow! Matthew, those words are so beautiful. Who wrote them? He said, Dad, I wrote them today for an English essay. And those words, the light shines ahead, just stuck with me. I just thought, wow, they are so beautiful and evocative of the existential surfing experience, which is riding inside the tube. And that was what I was most known for in surfing, riding inside that tube. And the light shines ahead just captured that experience in a very sort of emotionally resonant way. So he said, I love you, Dad. I said, I love you, Matthew. Put down the phone and, and, and Carla came on and we discussed some other business issues. So I get a knock on the door and it's three Japanese journalists who've come to interview me for a Japanese magazine and a film crew with them. And they say, sure, we'd like to take 
So Shul said, you to your favorite beach. So we go back to Hammond's Reef. We had this beautiful studio that this publicly traded company had erected for us. It was a quick drive, three minute drive down to the beach and standing on the beach with them, showing them California. Springtime California, a magnificent day in Santa Barbara. As beautiful as it can be. If you've been out to Santa Barbara, you know that there's days in April when it's just perfect. And I stood there thinking, wow, that is great. And then I feel that chill. Darkness. I just felt that dark layer. I don't know where it came from, but I felt darkness. I felt a chill. We took some more pictures. I said, let's go back to the studio. We walked on this beautiful path that's part that, that, that is fronted by these uh, magnificent eucalyptus trees. And I stopped by the big you. And I said to the guy, and I can clearly remember these words, there's nothing more important than a positive attitude. This is what I said to the Germans. Like, I was this big philosopher. There's nothing more important than a positive attitude. But in my heart, I know those are potent words to say. There's nothing more important than a positive attitude. We walked up, we jumped in my car, I got the phone call. Man, I got that phone call that no parent ever wants to get. Matthew is dead. From my wife, hysterical. I went, what? I just spoke. I spoke to Matthew two hours ago. What, what happened? How is it possible? How is it possible? God, how can you do this to me? I've been a good person. How can Matthew be dead? She said he played a dangerous game. He went to school. They call it the choking game. I don't know if you've ever heard it. The choking game. My son never, my son was a, this beautiful boy that loved us, that we loved. And he was dead. God, how can you do this to me? My faith and connection with God was severed right then. God, you have deserted me, man. You have turned your back on me. You're a good person. I've been a good, good man. I've been a mensch. How can you do this to me? And all I knew, I had to get back to South Africa, to get back to Carla. Because Carla, I knew, wouldn't make it without me. I got on a plane, and let me tell you, it was a harrowing, harrowing ride. Eventually, I get to South Africa, it takes about a day to get there. Cradle my beautiful wife in my arms, and we had to admit her. She was doing terribly, as I was. We were broken. Our heart and spirit had been ripped apart. Yeah, terrible things happen to good people. For weeks, I'm in the hospital with her. And she's just declining, declining, declining. I'm declining too, but I'm quite a strong person. I have the survivor spirit from my mom, from my dad. I'm a survivor, I know. I'm a survivor. I have to survive. I have to make her survive. But there's no way out of the downward spiral. And you've heard people speak about what breaks the cycle, what breaks the downward spiral. God turned his back on me, but he broke the spiral for me too. My wife's lying on her bed, and mom's sitting next to her. We're busted and we're broken. And a friend walks in. He said, I've got a message. One lightning bolt hits that hospital. I swear, out of a clear blue sky, not one cloud, one lightning bolt hits that hospital and rocks it to its foundation. Bang! Bang. One big lightning bolt. Out of a clear blue sky, look out the window, it's clear. He said, I have a message from Matthew. I said, how's that possible? I went and met a grief counselor, a woman who's spiritually connected. She said she connected with Matthew, and Matthew wants you to know he's sorry. Now, when you hear these stories, you automatically think, bullshit. How can <laughs> such a thing happen? How can a lightning bolt get a hospital out of a clear blue sky? I knew, I knew it was the truth. I knew. That was our moment forward. That spark, that light. What had my boy written? The light shines ahead. Those words, those words had such great power. I know that words have this 
incredible power. You guys, all the words have this amazing, amazing power. So it was a time now for us to climb out of the pit. And my wife and I feel differently. Both of us went on a spiritual path, but in different directions. But when I say different directions, we were like two big trees <laughs> that had been cracked by the storm, but we landed on each other and we held each other up and we grew together even stronger. I'd go and sit in my old shul in Durban where I had my bar mitzvah, and I'd sit there and think about my boy's words. The light shines ahead. And above the ark, where we have the Torah, five books of Moses, there's a lamp that shines. And any time you guys walk into a synagogue anywhere in the world, you'll see that light over the ark. And this light is called Neot Tamed. It's the everlasting light, the light of hope. And I'd sit there and think about my boy's words in Shumash, American people, and Hammond's Reef, an amazing place that my boy and I experienced. And you come to realize that there is a rationale to life. There is a purpose to life. And what can I find? What purpose can I find to honor my boy? What can I do next? So, a friend of mine phones me up. He says, hey, Sean, I've got to take you surfing. I've got to take you surfing. You can see how much I love surfing. I've spoken to you was my life. I had no desire to get in the world. I had no desire. Surfing was totally removed from my path. Sure, I've got to take you surfing. Sure, I've got to take you surfing. So eventually, he takes me surfing. And I paddle out there. It was probably one of the hardest things I've done. Paddle out there, and I'm crying. And as I cry, and surfing, you have to actually, when you paddle out, you push through waves. And the waves, and then they salt, and they just like wash my tears away. It's a wonderful feeling. It was like, wow, yeah, he's washing my tears away. And I paddled out, and I got that first wave, and I rode that wave, and I felt that man for you, what's with me? And I paddled up to my mates, and I said, what's the name of this break? Because surfers have very descriptive names for the waves they ride. Bands on a in Hawaii, Mavericks in Northern California. Sunrise. Sunrise. Amazing was it to hear that this way, my first surf session without my boy was sunrise. And in my heart, he was speaking to me, the light shines ahead. I knew that the sun would rise again. So my wife and I got involved in all sorts of different projects, healing projects. I released a, a, a surface code, you know, did all the talk shows and, 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 and really tried to tell people that after trauma, after loss, there's still hope. The sun will rise again. The light will shine ahead. So I'm out at Rincon, that famous wave that started the surface code. The guy comes up and he said, hey, Sean, I'm a headmaster of a local school. We have 80 students. I'd love you to come and talk at my school. Talk about the surface code. So I went, okay, great. The book had by then become popular. It went through a lot of printings. Um, wait, I think I might be getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Yeah, so. The book came out, became became popular, but my wife and I wanted to be family again. We lost our lights. We lost our beautiful son. We had lost our light. We lost our boy, Matthew, gift from God. So we put our name out of production because my wife was very fragile still, and uh, you know the whole natural birth thing wasn't on Thompson's radar. She couldn't have survived it. So we get a call. Here's a little graphic. We get a phone call. Very, very expensive graphic. The baby's just come up. Production. Are you interested? She said, I've been trying to get hold of you for like three days. I said, we just come back from South Africa. It's like being flying for three days. She said, just come up, just been born. And um, this is my nine family is interested. You've got to send me your profile. So we sent in our, our profile and, and we asked him, tell us a little bit more about the baby. She said, well, the baby was born three weeks premature. So my wife said, well, what, when was the baby supposed to be born? 25th of September. Matthew's birthday. 25th of September. We knew there had to be something. We said, this has got to be our child. 
She goes back to the birth mother. The birth mother says, you won't believe us. I originally wanted to keep the child. I wanted to call him Matthew. How's that? We knew that's our child. She said, it's your baby. And Carl and I drove out to the uh, hospital. It was just amazing. And picked up a beautiful boy. And we went and met the birth mother. We had the scene, seen our boy. And she said, what do you want to call your son? What do you want to call your son? So Carla looks at me out of it. Carla says, Luke. I think Luke's a great name. I went right on. I think it's a cool name. Luke. I just love that name. So we had to leave him in the hospital because he was praying in the incubator and we drove home. And I said to Carla, what does Luke mean? She said, I don't know what Luke means because Matthew was a beautiful Hebrew name and gift from God. So we phoned up a friend. This was before smartphones. We phoned up a friend. What's Luke mean? Just Google it. What? Healer. Bringer of life. Those words, my son said, the light shines ahead. It was like the universe and our disrupted world had been put on the right axis. And today, <laughs> I live in Luke's world, and that's my, my beautiful, beautiful, beautiful son. So, in Service Code, I've written this. I will know that there will always be another wave. But now, what was going to be my next wave? So I was sitting out at Brink and this guy came up to me the same grade where they had the environmental problems. He said, Sean, come and talk to my school. So I go to his school, Anna Kappa School, tiny little school, only 80 students. So. And talk about the book and speak to them about the code. I said, service code's my code. What's your code? Write your code for me. 12 months. Every line begins with it. I will. Two weeks later, I get this. I get a thousand lines of code back. And the very first line, I will always be myself. When I read those lines, I cried. I will always be myself. For all of you that work with children, I will always be myself. It's like an anthem. It's an anthem for you. And these other amazing words of power and passion and poetry, I will do what I say I will do. I will not compromise on my morals to fit in with others. Just beautiful, forceful, passionate, futuristic statements. I got so inspired. I thought, man, this is amazing. And then I started to get all sorts of codes from, from other kids. But I got so inspired by this, I thought, I'm going to write another book. And I wrote this book, The Code, 12 chapters. I didn't write the chapter titles. Every single chapter title is written by a young boy or a young girl. In the very first chapter, I'll be myself. In the last chapter, I'll share stories. And I knew it was my wish. That was my next way to go and share stories with children. Just tell them some stories and give them the code. Give them the code and see what they can do with their code. So this is a super cool code I get from a kid. He called it his 12 line thing. Hey Sean, my name's Garrison. I met you tonight at Flower Hill Mall and your words just resonated with me. I knew he was a surfer kid because only a surfer spells resonated that way. Like resin on a surfboard. <laughs> so now I travel all over the world and talk to kids. They create amazing graphics. This was a school in Florida. These kids created these amazing graphics. I will shine. I'll tell my own story. I'll live out loud. I'll let, I'll let my dreams outshine my fears. They created this exhibition. And not only did they inspire themselves, they inspired their friends, and they inspired the whole school. It's like I said, we drop the stone, create the ripple. Often it turns into the way. So kids across the world write their codes, create product. I will not let negativity bring me down. This is a young student in South Africa. Another young student in South Africa. I will be different. Ubuntu, that means brotherhood. It's like the Lola from where I lived in KwaZulu Natal, drug free, environmentally aware. So, kids all over the world are doing this cool stuff and, uh, and writing their codes. Here's my little boy school. I'll show you. Here's my little boy Luke. I will never abandon my friends. How 
precludes that. And what I'm saying to you, the power in this is the power of inspiration. But the inspiration ain't coming from me. The inspiration is coming from the hearts of young people. I'll be a pro baseball player. I will accomplish my goals. I will be the best that I can be. Pure, unfiltered passion and power. So I went back to grad school a few years ago, inspired by Nelson Mandela. Every time I speak, it's a homage. These are my solitude shares, but they're a homage to Nelson Mandela. I came across this amazing study. This is a pivotal study, and this is why our nation is in the shit that it's in right now, because of this study. This study was read deeply by many people, the wrong people. And it was a study with Facebook and the National Academy of Sciences. At the time, it was the biggest social study in the history of the world, 689,000 people. Yes, Cambridge Analytica has made it about 50 million people. But at the time this came out a few years ago, they proved that emotional contagion can occur without the recipient's knowing. All of us can influence behavior positively or negatively which is a fundamental tenet of leadership. How can you interest and inspire people for the positive, not for the negative? I came across this thing and wow, this is like a wave. This is like kind of what I've been doing, but with some scientific basis. I came across this other study. One million Americans die every year from poor choice, from lack of hope. The single biggest killer in the country is lack of hope. 20,000 out of 35,000 young people die every year. Also, ultimately, from this, they call it traffic accidents, homicide, or illicit drug, suicide, and a lack of hope. Pure positive interests like sport or academics, a feeling of no control, disassociation, disengagement, a lack of hope, small circle of friends, negative peer influences. Is it possible to create a positive way? Is it possible, as one person, to help activate a wave that's going to change fundamentally people's perception of hope. So I thought, I'm going to do an experiment. I'm still well known in South Africa. I was a big time athlete there. I'm going to do an experiment across a nation. Is it possible to create a positive wave across a nation through hope and words, getting kids to inspire each other? Is it possible to do this? One blood. So I hooked up with a big insurance company, one of the biggest in the country, and published. I said, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to do a tour of schools. We maybe do 24 schools, about 40,000 kids, and see if we can create this uh, positive way. And the goal was, I'll tell some stories. The Hawaiians, when you tell stories, they call it talk story. It's not like telling stories, they say it's talk stories. Maybe the kids will read the book or not, I wasn't sure. But get the kids to create a code and share their code and create this positive wave. So the goal was 24 schools, 30,000 kids. We printed hundreds of thousands of these badges. Did all sorts of media stuff to tell kids about what we were gonna do, and I hit the road. And I said to the publisher, these are the schools I wanna to talk to. The poorest and the poshest. You know that word posh? The poshest. The finest schools, and the poorest schools. I want to look into the heart and soul of the consciousness of kids in South Africa. This is one of the first schools. The school was in Kaplahong, a very poor area in near Johannesburg. And while apartheid is no more in South Africa, South Africa became democratic in 1994. The Civil War in the United States ended in 1964. That flag never came down. In South Africa, that flag came down in 1994, an old flag representing segregation of Hunter came down, and today every South African holds one flag of the Rainbow Nation. You can see me with my homage to, to Africa and Nelson Mandela, and I spoke to these young students. Now I'm thinking, how's my message going to be received? I'm a white guy that grew up in a apartheid. How are young black students going to connect with a message? I grew up culturally with a chasm between us. So, one of my first schools, China Global Television came down. I want to play this little video for you. 
Can you make sure the volume is, is, is up on this video? Yeah, that's good. Surfer Sean Thompson is one of South Africa's finest sporting heroes. Famous for his style of riding the tube section of the wave, Thompson won the International Professional Surfers World Championship in 1977. Considered one of the ten greatest surfers of all time, he now inspires others to follow his paddle. In this underprivileged school in Katahong on the east side of Johannesburg, Thompson shares with youngsters a simple strategy for confronting everyday challenges and making positive, life-changing decisions. It's so wonderful to be inspiring some young kid in Johannesburg or Durban or, or Los Angeles, anyway, just to know that you drop a little pill in the water and once it does, it's grab it away. And that wave is going to go and touch love. In 12 personal stories, Sean shares the power of I will, a code that carries him through life. Well, yes, this little code that I wrote, 12 lines that I wrote so many years ago, was about surfing. It's like every line is a metaphor. It can be interpreted in so many different ways. It's about how you can be a good person, how you can be a good human being, how you can make a difference in the world, how you can impact others. So I've been on this journey for 10 years now, since I lost my beautiful son, and surfing was this constant. Surfing helped get me back on the path to healing again. Many of these teenagers have barely seen the beach, but the code has resonated among them. I will achieve my goals. I will be better. I will dream big and I will be who I want to be. I will arrive and shine and I will face my fears and I will take charge of my life. Although all these youngsters were born after apartheid, many of them are still trapped by poverty. But the code is giving them courage to change their lives. In this country, I deprived the right of opportunities and I will break that cycle of being deprived of opportunities and I will create the opportunity for myself. This book will give me the courage that I don't have. It, I think it will give me that power to do what I want to do and to believe in myself. Sean Thompson's The Code is about many things. Faith, courage, creativity, determination. But above all, it's about promises we make to ourselves. About the future and to turn hope into action. Judy Shara, CGTN, Katahong, South Africa. Power contained inside those kids. I've got to tell you, those kids got nothing. Nothing. Those kids were at school on a Sunday. I went to that school on a Sunday. Those kids are on what they call seven day schools. Those kids go to school seven days a week because they know that education is their only path forward. And for me to see the resonance, to see the spirit, to see the absolute power of those kids was was Mamba. And um, I will be who I want to be. How does the kids just, the passion, like reminds me of the greatest leaders of all time. From Nehru to Mahatma Gandhi to JFK to Mandela to, Obama, to all these, Martin Luther King to these inspirational figures. And here you have a 14 year old kid just telling the world that they're going to change it. So we brought the way across the country. One of the best schools I went to was the school called Oklanga. This was the school when Nelson Mandela voted in 1994, the first black school in South Africa. And Nelson Mandela voted there with those words. I've come to report, Mr. President, that South Africa is now free. I just felt so honored to be in that presence. That's the principal, Dr. Justice. About a week after I was at the school, I get a video from him. He said, Sean, I got your book. You gave away thousands of books. He said, I gave it to my daughters. Check it out. Yes. Hi, Sean. Hi, Sean. My name is Lenny. This is my sister. Hey, our father is Justice, the principal of Okanya High School. So, and sorry about your loss. He was a big boy. So our dad gave us the book, the code, and that inspired our hearts to make a difference in our lives. So, we room and country 
about the validity of visualization your future, writing your future down, and creating from introspection action. So I'm encouraging all of you, use this code. Use this code. Get your patients, friends, your peers, even yourselves. I've seen those of some of the biggest companies of the world writing their codes to help transform their companies. 12 months. Everyone begins with I will. And you will be so surprised at the results. You'll be so surprised not only about what comes out of you, but what comes out of your peers. And that level of engagement, that level of vulnerability, and that level of group commitment that happens when one sits together and writes their code. Okay, so I'm going to finish at 2.30. It's 2.15. We've got one thing to do. And everyone, you're going to have two minutes to think. Write one line. I will what? I will what? Write one line. And whoever wants to stand up and share it quickly, I'm going to give you two minutes. So what we're going to do, well, I'll give you a few more minutes. So it's just before quarter past 12 at 20 past. We're going to get everyone standing up one at a time, sharing one out of your code. I will what? And I promise you, you're going to see something magic. Okay, so, so what are we going to do? Whoever wants to share their line of code, just from the corner of the room there, just stand up and say it loud, and then we'll just create this kind of little wave that goes across from one side of the room to another. I've never done it before, but I just thought it would be a, a cool thing to try. Is that, is that okay? So you know, just stand up and so you know, we need to hear it. I will what? I will do more for myself. I will be? Do more for myself. Love it. Uh, I will serve God with all my heart. Okay. I will love my child unconditionally. I will love my? I will love my child unconditionally. I love that. I love what you got to do. Anyone else wants to share? I, I will see my others who are not Anyone else want to share? I will share what I learned today with my son.
Shah. Well, thank you to, to everyone for for sharing for sharing that. When you do it in a small group with young people, you've got an indication of the power and the poetry and the nobility. And when I do it with businessmen, no one says I'm going to hit my hit my sales target. When people have a noble spirit. People want to show the best that they can be. And once it's written down, as any writer knows, words have incredible power. So I told you some stories today about attitude, courage, resilience, connectivity, underlying everything is spirituality. And the next wave, I didn't speak to you about, about self-awareness. But when Louise asked me to come and speak at the conference, I came across this, which she sent me, the five domains of post-traumatic growth. So every single one of the patients that you deal with that suffered that's been kicked to the ground, that's been through trauma, can grow. And these are the five domains. And this is how my little code can help your people. Personal strengths, I will, is power. When people read their code in a close environment, it play, creates closer relationships because People finally know what their peers, what their friends are all about. Spirituality. When people write their codes, it's spiritual. There is this connectivity to God. Many people, many of you mentioned God. It does give us a greater appreciation for life, that humility. And the last is new possibilities. I will is all about the future. And I want to leave you with one thing. I will power. When I went to Ohlanda School, the first black school in South Africa when Nelson Mandela voted, a guy came up to me. He said, my name is Amanda. He said, do you know what a mandla means? I said, yeah, I know what a mandla means. A mandla means power. Power. That was a black cry during the struggle. A mandla. And this, this, the cry of many white people too. The struggle wasn't just a black struggle. It was a struggle for mandla. Our will equals power. And the code, the ethos behind the code, and the telos, the purpose behind the code, is what you will, you will become. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>